This whole section of Luke, where Jesus is meandering his way to Jerusalem, where he is to face giving up everything in his own life on the cross, um, is focused in this section on, on two themes, which actually are interconnected. One of them is about being lost and about how God searches for the lost and will drop everything. But the other is about wealth, or the scripture calls it mammon, an old God who personifies not just wealth, but personifies uh, our whole desire and how trapped we are in serving and making a God of material possessions and those things that we think will give us peace and a freedom from our anxiety about having enough. And so what we've come to understand in this, what Jesus seems to be getting across, is that our, the mammon, our anxiety, keeps us from seeing or understanding God's search for the lost and blinds us to our own lostness. For we are lost in anxiety, in work, in drivenness because we are so afraid of not having enough. And the antidote to that is the God who seeks us and overturns that in finding us and welcomes us home to a new reality. And so Jesus fleshes out this story of the lost sheep with two more stories about lostness and about being found, but they're not quite as clear or precise. They're messy. They're not as clear and precise as the story of the lost coin or the lost sheep that set the theme. Here they are, stories that are real and true about us and about our values. The first, which of course, because I was preaching, the lectionary skipped over, was the story of the prodigal son. That marvelous story, you know, of the, of the, the younger son who asked for his inheritance in advance, who goes off and squanders it, winds up working the pigsty, which is the ultimate shame for a good Jew, and then, and then he says that he came to himself. He came to himself. You know those moments in our life when we wake up, when we ask ourselves, is this really what life is about? Is this what it's come to? And yet we feel trapped where we are and in what we're doing. We feel trapped in our work trapped in our life. And we don't feel that we are really alive. But to admit that, even to ourselves, is very humbling. But that's what happens. He got so desperate that he admitted to himself, he came to himself, and then he goes back to his father, ready to be his slave, to admit he's made a mess of his life, and the father runs to him and kisses him and welcomes him home and treats him not like, like, a, like a prodigal, but like a celebrity. Well, the reading today is the next story in that series, fleshing out the whole aspect of what it is to be lost. And in this story, you have a rich man who has a manager. And the word is that the manager who's working on making a lot of money has been squandering the rich man's money. And anyone in Jesus' day would most likely understand that such a rich man would be an absentee landlord whose manager would negotiate contracts and sign them on his master's behalf. And what this guy was doing, which was what a lot of managers did, 
was that he would tell the debtors, he would give the debtors one number that could be a third more or double or triple what his master was really owed. And then he would take it off the top with that usurious interest rate that he would charge. But it came to light. And then it says, like the prodigal son, he looks into himself. He says to himself, he sees also that he is lost and that there's no way out except to reverse his course, to give up all that he has amassed, all that he has worked for, all that he has placed his trust in, all his profits and income, and cut in half or a third what each debtor owes. And what's the result? Well, the implication in that parable is it's a win-win for the debtors and the master both. The rich man receives 100% of what he's owed, and the debtors find what they owe cut in half or a third. But what does the manager wind up with? Again, by implication, like the prodigal son, he too winds up with an abundance. He's got his freedom. He has friends galore who will always be ready to receive him into their homes and care for him in that tightly knit social network. And he has the friendship and commendation of his master. He gives up all his unrighteous income, as the Greek says, but he gains something more precious and enduring. What life is like when material things, when our anxieties are no longer our master, and when we're liberated to experience the generosity, the shalom, the peace of the kingdom of God. He was lost, but now he's found. Well, this is what many scripture scholars have termed the great reversal or the paradox of the kingdom of God or of the gospel. In fact, the word parable itself means to upturn the seemingly stable apple cart of how we've worked out our values and our lives. And what I love about these stories is that they are just so messy and so human. It's, it's so us. They're not a clear set of principles that we can follow to keep our lives in order. They're not laws, they're not rules. These men are lost, they're trapped, they're enslaved to the values and anxieties of the world around them. They're, they're in that survival mode and therefore they're about amassing material possessions to give them security, even if it means using other people even if it means at others' expense. They're about spending on their own pleasure rather than spending generously for the care of others or to sacrifice themselves for others, which in the values of the kingdom is what eternal life is about. So they are lost. And the process of their being found is messy, messy. They are us. Because you know what? You and I are lost as well. And in those moments when we come to ourselves, like the addict who comes to herself or himself in that moment and saying, I have no power in myself to help myself, that's the beginning, not the end. Because there's a higher power. Or as some of the stories I hear where some of you have found this church because you were somewhere else where you were being devalued or your thoughts were being devalued or where you were reading the scripture in a different way and you finally one day you thought, no, 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 
I do, I'm tired of being invisible. I'm tired of being discounted. I'm going to get up and I'm going to find another way. And that's where you were found. Maybe you were found in the pew here. And maybe that was a beginning. But we are all lost in the final analysis. I heard, I heard a story uh, in London uh, about a year ago. It was, uh, it was in a, uh, a lecture on uh, human trafficking and enslavement that still goes on right under our noses, even on the I-95 corridor. And the person who spoke said, we are all trapped in this because if you follow, if you follow the economic trail back to its beginning where you get to the level of the original materials that go into an iPhone or a droid, you will find human beings who are slaves. We're trapped. I'm not giving up my iPhone, I'm sorry. But we're trapped. But that's a beginning. This is my story and it's your story. But it's also the story of this church. And so I want to close where Father Grant closed his sermon because the beginning of our awareness of our lostness, of our trappedness, is the beginning of our liberation and being found by the one who loves us to death and will search for us until we're found. Maybe you and I, to pick up where Father Grant left off, rather than simply enjoying what we have, maybe you and I can find the joy and excitement and challenge and opportunity to be agents of the hound of heaven, the purveyors of the grace and joy we found here. Maybe our joy can be found not in thanking God for all we have here, but in the joy of reaching out and finding and inviting those who, like us, need to be found by the good news of what life and love and freedom and dignity are all about. And maybe that's where we can spend our unrighteous mammon. Amen.